Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jan Gaddy, and I'm here to welcome you to our uh, lunchtime webinar from Clark Schools for Hearing and Speech. Uh, the topic is Partners in Learning, Supporting Parents of Infants and Toddlers Who Are Deaf and Hard of Hearing. And I'm going to introduce our speakers today. We have Barbara Hecht on my left. Barbara is the director of our campus in Boston. She's also president of Option Schools International, which is a consortium of um, private schools that look at listening and spoken language in deaf and hard of hearing children. And um, she's also the co-director of our, um, uh, our telepractice project that we've had at Clark in collaboration with Clark Soundbridge in Connecticut. Hi, everybody. And for those of you who are not on the West Coast, good morning. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jan Gaddy. I'm the Director of Services for Children and Families at the Clark School for the Deaf. I also teach courses in family-centered practice, counseling, and child development at Smith College. Um, I wrote a book that has some of our content in it today. It's really for pre-service professionals and um, some parents who are interested in getting information from reading, so you can consult that if you'd like to. And I, with Barbara, am the co-director of the Clark Soundbridge um, Telepractice Project. And I'd also like to welcome <coughs> today Martha DeHaan um, as our guest speaker. Uh, Martha is the parent of two young adults who are deaf. Uh, she has prior experience in working with the newborn hearing screening program in Massachusetts before she came to Clark, where she now works as the outreach coordinator with really all of our campuses at Clark. Martha, you want to say hi? Yes, hi. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, for people who don't know, um, the Clark Schools for Hearing and Speech is, a, is an oral school. Uh, we provide children who are deaf and hard of hearing with listening, learning, and spoken language skills they need to succeed. We realize parents have many choices in the, um, in the approach they want to use with their children, but, uh, and the people at this table have expertise in, in this area. Uh, just a little bit of, in the way of an introduction. <clears throat> this webinar series is designed for professionals who are interested in the development of listening and spoken language with children who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, it's the last in a series of webinars this year. Uh, you, I hope that you um, maybe attended some earlier ones. We had one on mainstreaming, one on preschool parent involvement, and one on building professional networks, and those are available on our website if you missed any of those. Um, the last uh, of today's uh, the topic for today, which is the last in our series, is partnership with parents, infants, and toddlers. And because we are all very good teachers at this table, we have some behavioral objectives. By the end of the hour, you should be able to cite reasons supported by evidence of the importance of parent-professional partnerships. You should be able to identify the roles of the practitioner in developing and sustaining relationship with parents in your work. You should be able to list specific strategies or practices that serve to connect parents and practitioners and you should recognize, at least intellectually, the impact of loss on parent behavior. I'd like to say we don't, well, probably will not have time to entertain questions during the course of this webinar, but we're very glad to get them, and we will answer them by email, and an address will be provided at the end of the webinar. So write them down as you think of them, and then send them to us, and we'll answer them uh, in the future, in the near future. So on um, the topic for today, why partner with parents? Uh, there's a growing body of research demonstrates significant impact of parent-caregiver interaction on the way kids turn out with or without hearing loss. So we partner with parents because it improves child outcomes measurably. And I'm turning the mic over to Barbara, who's going to talk about some of that kind of uh, those measures. Hi again, everybody. Um, it's now been almost 20 years since uh, a seminal research study was published by Hart and Risley uh, looking at the impact, actually, of parent-child interaction on the language and cognitive development of very young children. They were not looking at children with hearing loss. They were looking at, at typically developing children in the state of Kansas. Um, and they looked at these children initially when they, were, when they were infants and toddlers, and then they followed up to see what their language development was like um, at later ages, up until the age of nine. What they found was that there was a very strong relationship between the parent 
language input and child language abilities years later. Uh, and so here are some of their key findings. The language and IQ abilities of children were very strongly related to the amount of child-directed language. Uh, the more that parents talked to children, the faster their vocabulary grew. Uh, and these differences held up over years. So very early input, very early interaction to children was linked to academic success um, many years later. Um, <clears throat> they actually looked at three groups of families, families um, with disadvantaged backgrounds economically, uh, families from uh, who's, uh, who were, where the parents were professionals, and families who were sort of classified at that point as middle class families. Um, and they actually saw that there were differences related to socioeconomic status in terms of the number of words that children heard throughout the day addressed to them. <clears throat> and um, what's interesting isn't so much the economic backgrounds of the families, but the impact of the language input. So uh, the children from the most advantaged homes heard over 2,000 words per hour on the average, whereas children from homes where people interacted with them less um, heard at around six, 600 words per hour. <clears throat> and so when they began to sort of look at the, at the impact of this, it, it looked like if you extrapolated uh, from the time the children were birthed to about age three, um, they, children whose parents talked to them a lot, heard 30 million more words uh, than children whose parents did not talk with them very much. And you may have heard of some of the um, projects now going on in the Chicago area, in the Rhode Island area, that are really aiming to bridge that gap. Because if we look at the Hart and Risley study, we see that the, the gap just continues to widen for children. The children who hear a lot of words early on continue to, to hear more and more words early more and more words as they grow older. And so we want to really do something to reduce the, uh, the gap or to bring everybody sort of to that steep language learning trajectory if possible. Um, <clears throat> very much more recently, we actually now have technology that allows us to do this kind of research uh, a lot more quickly and efficiently with a device called the LENA, which actually records and analyzes auditory input to children. It looks at words and background noise and utterances and turns. And uh, a number of studies using this LENA device have actually confirmed the initial Hart and Risley findings. Uh, and they really were looking at uh, the people who have been using, doing these more recent LENA studies, were looking at parents who were really described as more talkative versus those who interacted with their children less and were referred to as taciturn. It's important, though, to recognize that it's not just the number of words that children hear, but it's really the quality of those interactions. And um, very recently, this year actually, uh, at the White House there was a gathering on bridging the word gap. Um, and a number of people, including Catherine hirsch Pasek, um, reminded us all that, it, that better predictors of language skills than sheer number of words is the quality of the interactions involving those words and the kind of ongoing conversations that parents have. Hart and Risley certainly noticed that as well, but it, is, it isn't just a matter of quantity, it's a matter of quality. And so the bottom line, really, from this research with, uh, with hearing children and typically developing children is that the amount and quality of language addressed to those children is much more predictive of their language skills than other, uh, other measures that have shown to be associated with language development in the past. So what does that mean for children with hearing loss? Uh, if, if this is true of children who, who have full auditory access, it's even more true. Uh, that parent engagement and involvement turns out to be a major predictor of child outcomes when children have hearing loss. Uh, in 2000, so we're talking about almost 15 years ago now, uh, Mary Pat Moeller uh, published a study looking at the impact of early intervention on language outcomes for, for uh, 
hard of hearing children and children with, um, with a, a range of degrees of hearing loss. And she found that, that the degree of hearing loss was not as predictive as they would have thought, um, in part because they didn't have a very wide range of um, degree of hearing loss. Uh, age of enrollment in early intervention was a very important predictor, but most important actually was family involvement, which explained most of the variance in the language outcomes. The earlier the families entered early intervention, uh, the more time parents had to gain confidence and skills and to be able to interact with their children. And then just last year, Alexandra Quitner and her colleagues uh, published the first of a number of studies. Uh, this, these are, this was a national NIH uh, study following children with cochlear implants. And they found, that again, that parent behaviors predicted language gains four years after they looked at those parent behaviors. Uh, they looked at measures like parent sensitivity. Um, and by sensitivity, they really meant parents uh, responsiveness to, um, to conversational openings from children and following up on children's questions, um, and also greater linguistic sensitivity and stimulation. Those were very, very strongly associated with outcomes for children with cochlear implants. And now Jan. Yeah, so this is Jan again. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about the language learning environment of children who are acquiring spoken language. Um, we acquire a native language with someone who adores us. Um, and we do that by um, natural informal interaction with the fluent user of that language. We do it in the course of play. We do it in caregiving routines, diapering, washing dishes, putting a child in the car seat, anything that's done in day-to-day -day life. We talk to them while, they're, while the children are engaged in the activity. We do it during all waking hours if conditions are optimal. And, and it's important that that language is adapted to the child's needs and interests. Uh, we also know that conditions are rarely optimal, that there's a difference between child-directed language and just being present during another's interaction. Um, overheard language, inc incidental language, is far less available to young children. And it's not enough to just bathe the child in language. The language actually has to be meaningful. We have to get the child's attention and, and it really needs to speak to their in level of engagement with the activity. Um, I'm going to call your attention to this graph. Um, if you did attend the earlier webinars, Meredith Berger from our New York campus talked about parent relationships with preschool children because in, when children become three years old, they usually um, leave the home and are involved in some kind of preschool activity. And that's a time when their uh, other adults are interacting with them. But even the preschool child is still involved for 71 hours a week with um, individual kind of interaction with the caregiver. Did you want to talk any more about that, Barbara? Right, and the, the, the length of the school day or the preschool day can vary, but what's important to note here is, is how big that, brown, <laughs> that yeah. brown part of the pie is. That's the time when the child is awake and available for interaction. And that's the time that we have to think about when we're thinking about the outcomes for children. Thank you. So the next graph is really depicting the waking and sleeping time of um, an infant toddler's week. So these are children zero to three. And you should focus on that little tiny red wedge because for many children, that's what their early intervention time looks like. An early interventionist will come to the house or the child will go to a center for two hours. There will be some kind of really clear, directed focus to language acquisition. If that was the only time that the children, ben that the children experienced that, it would really be, it would be insignificant in terms of their learning. So the goal during this time is really to help the parents figure out how to best adapt their behavior to that big blue chunk of time so that children are aware of language and, and available to learn language during that period of time. Um, those are um, the implications for children with hearing loss is that language intervention really should happen during all waking hours. It's the caregivers who are the primary um, agent 
in helping the children to interact and acquire language. So our work as early intervention practitioners really has to focus on teaching the parent, um, giving the parent information, teaching them skills, and also looking at their engagement with their children and helping them capitalize on that. Uh, the next two slides <clears throat> represent a list of challenges that were from a survey of early intervention providers. You know, these are what are the things that you face in your day-to-day -day work that, um, that you have to think about overcoming or at least addressing because they're potential barriers to efficacy. So the first one is you want to have an effective communication with the parents, a kind of system of communication with reciprocity and trust and, um, and good, clear conveying of information and feelings. Uh, counseling parents through the assessment and diagnostic process. This is a process and parents need, it's an it's emotional process and it's also filled with a lot of content. So helping them to really understand that intellectually and assimilate it emotionally. Getting parents to follow through on recommendations for intervention. This is a difficult time for them emotionally and, and um, following through requires a lot of agency. So helping them to be able to garner support for that. Encouraging involvement. Um, at home and carry over at home. Involving the parents in um, EI sessions, in any kind of group sessions and treatment. Encouraging buy-in or follow-through. So you're really looking at the parents' commitment to any decisions they've made and helping them carry out those decisions. Um, parents of young children are seldom just dealing with one sort of challenge in their life. I mean, they might have a child with a disability, which is um, until they get an understanding of it is a challenge. But there are other children, there, there's work, there's adjusting your time, so, um, so supporting them through those other challenges as well. Working effectively with families from different cultures and language backgrounds. Um, Barbara's going to talk a lot more about that um, later on in our, in our presentation. And developing a, a personal relationship, but a professional relationship. So the relationship should be characterized by intimacy, reciprocity, but it also has some boundaries in it so everybody feels safe. This is Barbara again. Um, I was just thinking that uh, collectively, be <clears throat> behind the screen, uh, in front of the microphone, yeah. Um, we have many, many, many years mm -hmm. of experience, probably approaching 100. Yeah. Uh, and that's because we started this work when we were just, born very just young. children. Yeah. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> over the years, we've really learned quite a bit about how to face, how to address the kinds of challenges that uh, early intervention practitioners uh, mentioned when we surveyed them. And we often... Um, Keep find, we find ourselves turning back to and looking at and learning from uh, three pioneers, really, who, who have addressed these issues in various ways. Uh, the first is Louise Tracy, uh, who founded John Tracy Clinic in 1943. She was the parent of John Tracy, who was born profoundly deaf. And she founded John Tracy Clinic, which really started as a parent support group, a parent-to-parent uh, parent -parent education and support group. And she recognized very early on that one of the ways of dealing with these challenges is to provide emotional support for parents. She knew it as a parent herself, um, and she really put that into practice. Um, a, a generation later, basically, Ken Moses, who um, is a psychologist and a, and a parent of a child with with a number of, of uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, Ken Moses developed a framework for, for working with parents uh, and supporting parents through grief, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and David Luterman, uh, an audiologist who, um, I guess, practiced audiology, but in his, in his uh, whole being was really a counselor and psychologist. Mm -hmm. David Luterman really has emphasized the, the importance of psychological support for families and, and trusting parents. So how do we address the challenges that we face when we're providing early intervention? Uh, we've certainly learned that there's no magic bullet, um, but there are certain approaches that really have developed a pretty strong evidence base that are effective. Uh, the first is that we need to pr find a way to provide emotional support and education to parents. Uh, the more that parents feel supported and the more knowledgeable they feel, the more effective they can be. Uh, and that often involves reframing 
traditional parent professional roles. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment as well. And we also need to address family values, culture, and diversity. David Luterman, uh, in one of, one of his uh, publications, talked about various tenets um, or sort of guidelines. And um, one, of, one of the guidelines that I've actually um, printed out and put up on my wall <laughs> is, uh, if you take good care of the parents, the children will turn out fine. This is very hard, actually, for us to, um, to follow through on and truly believe sometimes. Um, but what David is really saying here is that if we can provide emotional support from the beginning, if parents really feel that we're there with them for the journey um, and that we're really there for, as a resource to them, that um, they will actually be able to be effective with children. Um, a huge part of that taking care of parents comes from, from connecting parents with other parents and providing support groups. Ken Moses um, had a very different kind of take, but one that, that dovetails very nicely. Ken Moses worked with uh, families whose children had a variety of uh, challenges, developmental challenges and disabilities, and he he really was, I think, one of the first to say that parents grieve the loss of the child that they had anticipated. Um, that hearing loss, like other, like other differences, um, can really shatter parents' dreams if the parents are hearing themselves, if they have no experience with hearing loss. Everything that they dreamed about for their children is suddenly turned upside down, and that that actually causes a kind of grief that's that in some ways feels a lot like uh, the losses that we would associate with with death, um, and that the mourning process that goes along with um, that really involves the recovery from grief is um, is a positive one that allows parents to move on um, and eventually to to develop hope. Uh, grief is a very loaded term and it sounds, it sounds heavy and it sounds weighty, um, but one of the things that Ken Moses pointed out is that unlike what, what uh, we may have initially thought from Kubler-Ross's early, uh, early work, grieving feelings don't really occur in stages, they're more like states. Um, it's a messy, uncomfortable, unpredictable process. But it's also a healthy process and very central to the growth of the child. But part of what we have to recognize as professionals is that we can't fix the feelings that parents have. We can, and we can't really rush the process. Um, and if we think about um, the, the various states of grieving that um, I think we're all fairly familiar with, it's important to think about these these grieving states um, as potentially important and positive, um, positive feelings that, that families have. So when I keep saying that these are positive feelings, uh, they're sometimes hard for us to deal with as practitioners. And so that brings us actually to a poll. We'd like to ask you now, um, when you are working with a family or a care, caregiver that is really experiencing one of these um, grieving states. Which of these is the hardest for you to deal with as a practitioner? Is it denial, anxiety, depression, guilt, or anger? So we'll give you um, a short while to think about these and let us know which of these you find most challenging in your work. So while you're while you're thinking this through, we're watching the poll. This and, is very exciting. And actually, we, we thought <laughs> we thought that this might this it might be actually worth doing this on a larger scale right. and gathering yeah. doing a little research study on this. Um, but do let us know what you find the most challenging. And the results are coming in. This is a it, it's, it's a very appropriate post-election day <laughs> process. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's I didn't. 
Great. Okay, see. so um, the the results are are really quite um, quite disparate, but yeah. the mo one of the most difficult, the most difficult by far, we had. Can I read it? Sixty. Yeah. 66% of, of people said that denial is, the, is one of the toughest to deal with. And following that is anger, um, then guilt, depression, and anxiety. So um, let's talk about denial for a moment. Um, I think one of the reasons that, I'll just speak for myself, one of the reasons that denial is so hard for us is that we see what's possible. We know now what's possible for children with hearing loss. Uh, we want parents to get started right away. We want them to get those hearing aids on. We want them to start, you know, to sign up with early intervention. We want them to come to the appointments. And when they don't, when they seem to not even be recognizing the importance of these things or even truly recognizing that their child has needs, um, it's, it's really, really tough for us. And um, we want to jump in and, and sometimes do it for them. Um, Anger, I wanted to mention anger also because um, it is, it's sometimes easier for us to uh, comfort a parent who seems outwardly sad. Uh, but when a parent is just kind of expressing anger, and, and it's not necessarily even anger about the hearing loss, but just mm -hmm. sort of blasting, uh, it's very hard for us to remember as practitioners that it's really not it may be directed at us, but it's really not just about us. It's mm. really, it's, it's part of the process of coping. If we think about denial as a time to, that parents sometimes need to gather their resources, to, to find the external support, to just be able to move forward, then our, our job is to kind of support families through that process um, and make sure that they don't get stuck there but also um, also understand that it is part of the process. It certainly doesn't help to say you're in denial. Right. <laughs> right. None of us want to hear somebody say, you're right. in denial, you're anxious. Um, but it does help when we remember that it's a, it's a healthy part of the process as long as it's part of a process. Uh, families have also told us that um, grieving doesn't get resolved exactly because it kind of reemerges. And one parent said to me um, that she thought that her grieving and her feelings about the, the mixed feelings she had uh, sort of went into remission. <laughs> they didn't exactly disappear. And, the, and some of those um, feelings caught her off guard uh, when she started thinking about transition to preschool or transition to uh, their their public school program or when they went uh, to Thanksgiving dinner and all the cousins were running around without hearing aids mm -hmm. talking away um, so sometimes these feelings um, these difficult feelings can reemerge um, and and there are times that are predictable where we really need to be there and ready to support families and other times that we can't always be there um, because they're they're relatively unpredictable. One um, one area that's that I think is sometimes surprising to practitioners though is that um, parents who have had a deaf child and then have another child with a hearing loss, um, we sometimes as practitioners think that that second time around is going to be easier. But Jan's going to now talk a little bit about some experiences that she's had uh, working with families with where there's more than one child with a hearing loss. I'm just looking at this slide, and I think the title should have been One More Time with Feeling instead of Lost Second Time Around. But um, this is my 40th year at Clark and um, in Northampton. It's, a rural, uh, it's in a rural setting, and I've been doing this work for most of that time. And um, there was a time when there were a number of families, and you're in a rural setting, you just capitalize on what the demographics are at that time, a number of families who had second-born children with hearing loss. And um, they were definitely more confident about their parenting abilities. But um, what I was observing when I was working with them is that they seemed to be more emotionally devastated um, than I thought they should be. I mean, they, they sort of had the experience, their environment was already adapted to meet the needs of children who were deaf and hard of hearing. They had another sibling who was kind of helping out, or at least a distraction. Um, so I, I formed a group, and we called it one more time with feeling, because 
what I realized is that a lot of that coping, um, those coping abilities and, and behaviors that were around during the first time, first time child, were, they, they'd already done that. And what they were left with was really any kind of unresolved um, a sense of loss about the adjustment to having a, a child who had special needs. Um, and also that the professionals and extended family members were less of a support during this time, particularly if the firstborn child was developing really well. There was this sense of, you can do it, you did it before, look, out, look how confident he is, look how happy he is, look how integrated he is into the family. So they really weren't there talking about, yeah, but you still have to have these appointments and more, and, and more sensory aids. So um, it was a, it was a I, I guess what I would say we learned from that is that, um, that that adjustment to loss isn't just, it's just not a one-time thing. It happens periodically through uh, life. Um, so how to support parents who are going through this adjustment uh, to loss? Um, take time to listen. Uh, listening is a very active process. Martha is going to talk more about this. And you should practice enough by offering parent support, which is uh, being empath empathic, um, non-judgmental, uh, unconditional in your acceptance of these people as individuals, and helping them to focus. So what the behavior looks like is when you're working in a group like this, and um, I realize I'm the one who's talking, and that's not really good. The other parents should be talking. I should just be sitting back in a listening posture. But you want to ask a few questions. Those questions should be open-ended. You're not really there to give advice. Um, you are there to accept and to also help parents maintain a focus. When you're going through a period of grief or loss, you get distracted internally by emotional issues. So to help them stay focused is, is a good support. Um, the professional need not be a psychologist. Um, this is just a really normal uh, adaptation to having a child who you don't know much about and who may need some special kinds of, of support. Um, and it will come up in your sessions in, in ways that you might not expect. Um, you can help by listening to and respecting parents if they're having a hard time, kind of put aside your lesson plan, be available to them. Um, if you can acknowledge what you observe to be painful feelings or frustration or fatigue directly, um, you can, um, you can uh, touch them. I mean, you know, um, <clears throat> we know that touch is a very uh, compassionate strategy when people are suffering. Um, remain non-judgmental and continue to think of yourself as a support, as an aid, but not to rescue. And so when we were chatting around the table, we were coming up with some examples. You know, if a parent is saying, I really can't get to the audiologist, I don't make the appointment because I don't have transportation, and I don't know how I'm going to do that, then your approach would be, well, let's look at your support system. You know, who's in it? What can they offer? And let's look at transportation, particularly because you're going to have a lot of transportation issues going to appointments. So let's see if we can help you with that. And then you can say, you know, would it be helpful for you to have somebody like me uh, there at the appointment to listen with you? And if they say yes, you say, fine, I'll meet you there at the appointment and, and we can process that together. Um, Martha. Martha Dahan is our next speaker and I did introduce her briefly in the beginning but for those of you that were still pulling your lunch out of the microwave and you might not have heard, um, that is on the East Coast, you <laughs> might not have heard uh, the introduction. I'm going to ask Martha just to tell a little bit more about yes. her background. As we're all talking a little bit about our experience, I began um, my relationship at Clark. I realized personally I came here over 20 years ago and one of the first people that I did meet was Jan. And um, now I've worked here for close to seven years. And it's really an honor for me to be able to speak today about what helps in, uh, for parents and what parents say, and to speak on the be their behalf, not just from my experience, but what other parents have to say also. And as we've uh, mentioned quite a bit today, we talk about professionals who listen. And parents are really smart. They know when professionals are listening. And it might begin by their body language, as Jan said, you know, touch. Um, and also, they'll know if the professionals really know where they are at per, um, emotionally. And um, by knowing that, the, the parents will hear that the professionals will give them advice maybe about some of the next steps that they suggest that might work for them. 
Um, something else that parents say help are support groups. And um, I can say that some of the support groups that I attended, I found valuable, of course, but some of them that were right in my local early intervention pro support groups, right in the early intervention program that I attended. And it, the, the support groups were not just for, for families of children with hearing loss. They focused on all disabilities, and I found them to be very beneficial. Um, now there's also a number of online forums and listservs. I and a lot of other families and parents participate in those. And I think what's great about them is it's a comfortable place. You may choose to participate or you may not. So there's no pressure. Some of them that I participate in are CI Circle, there's Listen Up, and there's some parent blogs. So it's always useful, I think, to suggest to parents some of those forums that they can look at. Participating in support groups is a great place to meet experienced parents, and it's also an informal way if you want to meet some deaf adults. While attending parent groups, you know that the parents will come along with their children, so it's really a nice opportunity for parents of newly diagnosed babies to come in and see the other children with hearing loss. They're meeting some older children who are deaf and hard of hearing, and it can give the parents some hope and see what the possibilities are for the future. Of course, attending workshops, reading, and learning from others, it's all more knowledge, it's all helpful, because we know that the majority of parents who have children with hearing loss have no history of deafness in their family. So the knowledge that they acquire will breed confidence. As Jan mentioned, I worked with the Newborn Hearing Screening Program here in Massachusetts for over seven years. And so while I was working there, I would call families who were going through the process of diagnosis. They were learning about their communication choices, they were enrolling in early intervention and with a specialty service provider. So I was hired because um, of my experience of being a parent of two children with hearing loss, but it really wasn't about me. It wasn't about sharing my story. I really believe it was truly about listening. So, and as a listener, you can learn about a lot about the parents. You can learn that they may be confused and they may need clarity. They may need information about the next steps, as I mentioned earlier. And you can also learn more about their emotional well-being or their ambivalence and vacillation about the choices that they need to make. So as a parent, then turned professional, I really want to reassure parents that they were doing the right thing. I mean, don't we all want to know that we're doing the right thing, we're making some right choices? And so when parents would share with me about where they were at in the process, I always tried to find something that I could compliment them about and just to let them know that they were doing something that, that was probably really good and the right thing. So there was always something positive. And it might be that they started their early intervention appointments on a regular basis, that they went for the second opinion, or that their child wore their hearing is just a little bit longer that day. So as a parent-to-parent -parent connection, I wanted families to know that I was there for them, to connect with them, because I understood where they were at. I had been there before. I had gone through a lot of the same steps. But I also felt reconnecting was important. So during that initial, the initial phone call I would make with families going through newborn hearing screening, I would take notes. And during those notes, I would be able to write down a few things that maybe were about the next steps they were doing or where they were at in their process. So when I made the follow-up call, I would be able to refer to those notes. And I always felt like it was a true reconnect if I could refer to something in my initial call. It's no different than when you're reconnecting with a friend. And it's funny, when my kids were first diagnosed, I read a quote, um, and it was geared towards professionals, and it said, a sign of success for a professional is when the parent feels the relationship is like a friendship. And it's true. I mean, the early intervention provider came into my home. We sat on our floor. We played with the kids. And the last day that she came to visit was a really sad day because she really became a friend because I shared so much with her. So because families are going through this difficult time, again, the reconnecting contact is a good time to remind them of the available resources and services for them and their child. Because it's such an emotional time for parents, sometimes they don't hear everything the first time, so it's really worth repeating. So lastly, um, parent challenges. Uh, we can't disregard that there are always challenges and there were things that were never anticipated for these families. Parents are now faced with the fact that their child wears hearing aids, and people are going to see them, and they'll need to explain it to their family, to their friends, and even to strangers. 
Uh, when I was preparing for this webinar with Jan and Barbara, I shared a story with them about how, uh, with parent-to-parent -parent connection, we hosted a family um, in our home one night for dinner, and their child had just been diagnosed with a hearing loss. And when we were having dinner, the mom uh, made a comment about the framed pictures of our son in our, in our living room. And she says, do you always take pictures with his hearing aids on? And I was struck about where she was emotionally with her diagnosis of the, for her child. So clearly, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, other challenges may be press, pressure from professionals. Some are promoting different opinions and um, different communication options, such as sign language versus spoken language. I always say that families are really thrown into a field of controversy. They feel this intensity of having to make a decision about the communication option. And during this adjustment phase, I guess we'll call it, of learning that the you know, child has a hearing loss and they've got all these fears and concerns for their child, um, they, they've got lots of thoughts going through their, their mind about, you know, we need to purchase hearing aids. Which ones do we purchase? Do we get cochlear implants? If so, which one? Where will the surgery be done? Who should do this? Um, where will they go to school? And they're even thinking and worrying about the future, such as will they drive? Will they have friends or will they date? Will they get a job? So there's lots of unknowns and uncertainties about their child's future. Um, but regardless of the challenges with this low incidence disability, hopefully families gain support and knowledge and partnership, what we're talking about today. And the partnership can be from other parents or from some strong professionals. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Martha. So Barbara talked earlier about reframing parent professional roles. So I, this is a little didactic kind of slide to explain that. Um, when you're deforming a relationship with a parent, we have different roles. The, par the professionals are the experts on content on hearing loss. They know about that intellectually, academically, and experientially. Um, they know about the effects of um, hearing loss on the development of children. They know about the technology associated with it. And they know about language acquisition and the risks when you hear uh, imperfectly. So that's, th that's, what they, that's what they bring to the relationship. They're also a coach to the parent. They're a mentor to the parent, and they're the parent's teacher. The parents, um, on the other hand, are the experts on their child. They know them better. They spend more time with them. If they don't know them, our job is to help them learn about them because they really, that's really what they bring to the table. And they take on an active role as a facilitator in the child's development. Uh, this tenant, too, goes back to the list of tenants that David Luderman came up with. And this is a direct quote from David. Um, you cannot go any faster than the parent is ready to go. And you can't save children from their parents. And I, I feel like that's a, a little judgmental in the statement, so I want to just expand on it a little bit. Um, I think when people enter this work, and especially if they're experienced, they sort of look at the children and they see potential. They don't see, actually, the risks as much. And they see the potential and what's possible. And they're worried. They get worried if a parent is at a certain stage of, um, of coping where they're very limited in their ability to support the child. So, and the, and the, parent, the professional um, doesn't want to see that uh, potential not met. So I think that's where it comes from. But really, the, ki the kid is going to develop fully with the parent. So you need to stay in step with the parent. And to want something that's different at a different time than the parent wants is really kind of a recipe for failure for all parties. The child doesn't make the progress that's possible. The parent feels, um, not, it feels incompetent and not confident, and, and the professional doesn't feel like they're doing their job very well. Uh, the role of a professional, and I'm collapsing some of these. We've talked about this throughout, but um, the professional is a counselor. That's someone who supports. They're a coach, so they observe parents and they make suggestions based on what they feel is within that parent's kind of scope of parenting uh, behavior. They're teachers. Uh, they do model strategies that they know work for them and to see if the parents, if that's the sort of comfortable thing for the parent to do. And then this con convener, mentor, and facilitator really speaks to collaboration, that the parents have to first collaborate with the um, 
EI team, and then they're collaborating with their, with their preschool team, and then there's the medical home team and their doctors. So we're really teaching, I mean, as a professional, you're really a counselor, you're a coach, and or you're a collaborator, and that's what we help the parents to do. Um, excuse me. So um, the, the setting for EI, um, the visit, home visit expectations, I think the expectations from the parents may, may be that they're going to see a certain kind of change in behavior in the children. So it's really incumbent on the practitioner to um, talk to the parent about being an active learner and that the primary focus is going to be on the interaction between the parent and the child that you're very interested in their observations, help the parents observe, ask them what they see, give credit to that. If you see things that they don't see, see if you can help them to observe that. And the emphasis should really be on natural everyday activities. I mean, diapering, washing dishes, preparing food, um, and not something that's sort of staged so that the parents think that that's the way, that the only way the children are gonna acquire language. I wanna talk a little bit about coaching. Uh, coaching is sort of different from just teaching in that the parent really takes the lead for carryover. The professional may demonstrate um, a kind of strategy or a behavior, um, but they very quickly give that back to the parent and see how the parent does it, if they're comfortable with it, what it looks like when the parent uh, uses that information. They observe the parent, they encourage the parent, if they see a way that, you know, a sort of missed opportunity, they make that suggestion uh, very judiciously, and then they go back to the role of observer. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Barbara, who's going to talk a, a little bit about diversity in the families we work with. Hi again. Um, one, of the, one of the areas that a number of EI practitioners really talk about as, as a challenge is when the language and the culture of the family is quite different from their own. Um, and this is, um, this is reality for, for all of us who, who engage in early intervention um, because as we look at, at, this, um, at some of the statistics on this slide, um, in many parts of the country, more than 40% of the families are actually um, uh, speaking a language other than English at home. Uh, Spanish actually is the fastest growing. It's the language of about half of non-English speaking uh, families in the United States. In some areas, in some urban school districts, there could be up to 80 different languages spoken. And in many parts of the country, in some states and regions, so-called minority groups are actually in the majority. So what do we do if if we're not, if we don't share a language and a culture with the family that we're partnering with. Um, first, we certainly have to find a way to bridge the language barrier. Uh, and it's, it's sometimes very challenging to do that, but if we don't have a way of communicating directly with the parent and we end up just working with the child, we're not really uh, being as effective as we can be. And he, this is a, a list here kind of in uh, descending order of importance or effectiveness, I would say, rather than importance. It's wonderful if you've got bilingual, bicultural, professional staff who can work with a family in their own language and culture, uh, but that's rarely the case. And um, so we have to bring in interpreters, use language banks, phone-based interpreting, even written translation, sometimes pulling in family or friends in a pinch. Um, but it, it's important to, uh, to find some ways of communicating with parents so that they really do feel that they're part, they're part of the early intervention process. It's certainly the case also that it's not just about the language barrier. Very often there's a culture barrier. Um, and there's a wonderful book, if you haven't read it, I strongly recommend it. It's um, called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down by Anne Fadiman. Um, and we'll actually add it, I think, to our resource list. So you'll have some information about that book. But that book actually uh, nicely captures some of the difficulties that professionals have when the belief systems, the religion, um, the values of the family or even the way the, the family interprets um, disability or diversity is different from, from our own. The challenges for early intervention providers 
um, especially come up when child rearing practices are different or um, if, uh, if a family feels that, it, that their child's hearing loss will somehow disadvantage them, seriously disadvantage them in, um, in their community. And so we, that's often the time that we see families pulling off the hearing aids, um, not, not wanting to sort of acknowledge um, the, the hearing loss, but there are a variety of cultural beliefs and differences that can potentially um, be a barrier for the, for the relationship that you develop with parents. And so one of the things that we've really learned is that it's wonderful if we can find not only a language translator, but a cultural translator. Um, and even if that's not the case, parent-to-parent -parent support and finding ways to, to get parents together often is so much more powerful than we ever could imagine. That When parents discover the things they share in common, um, parent support can greatly trans transcend cultural difference. And care and support from, uh, from their professional also can transcend lots of differences. Uh, when we're trying to bridge this gap, effort is greatly appreciated. Um, you don't have to do it perfectly. You don't have to cover everything. Um, and s someone once said, affect is more important than mm -hmm. content. Um, but effort and, and really being kind of explicit and saying, you know, explain to me, explain this to me. I, I really, um, I'd really like to learn about this. Um, really using the parents as resources for you so you can, you can help bridge that gap. Another lesson that we've all learned uh, in many, many years of working with families where English is not the primary language or, or certainly not the only language is for many families having the child use the language of the home and the community is extremely important as well as learning English. And so um, if we can develop a language plan where we actually talk with the parents about the fact that this might not happen just automatically, we really might have to plan for who's going to use what language when and under what circumstances and what the goals are for, uh, for learning each language in, in the home and community. Jan. Thank you. So lesson four is that uh, grieving and culture interact in complex ways. In many cultures, uh, children with disabilities are not as well assimilated as they are in the United States, and it's important for us to be aware of that. Um, religion and other cultural um, uh, rituals can be a source of comfort, um, but if you have a child who doesn't fit comfortably into your culture initially, that can be a source of stress. Um, observe the parents, um, help them to educate you. Barbara said that, being very direct about that. Um, and I would also say know who you are, know your culture, know your beliefs, because if you're acting authentically, it's much easier to have a close relationship than if you're trying to be something, somebody else. Um, at all times, you should avoid stereotypes. Um, I think it, irrespective of culture, human beings have some basic um, beliefs in, when they raise their children. The, I, I've, I've, the great thing about this job is that I've done this work all over the world. And um, it, irrespective of culture, I find all families want to nurture their children to adulthood. They want them to grow fully. Um, they want them to be able to survive after they're gone. They want to pass on their culture to them, and they want them to know what they know about the world um, and pass that on to their children. How they do that depends on their history, their experiences, their temperament, and their cultural beliefs. And it's really just a joy to observe that when you're doing your work. Uh, connecting families with the 21st century. I mean, when I first came here, we did face-to-face -face interactions with families, and that was it. And now we have many, many other um, venues and medium for getting in touch with parents. There's face-to-face -face interaction. Um, there's texting. There's emailing. There's chat groups that are formed online, um, phone calls, video conferencing. Um, and um, so all of these have a, real, a lot of open avenues for contact and interaction. Um, I wanted to just mention a, a word about boundaries. 
you know, Martha talked about um, the importance of a practitioner feeling like a friend, and I think that is important. I mean, it's, it implies there's warmth, there's reciprocity, there's trust, there's acceptance. Those are really good characteristics in a relationship. But we don't want to be friending parents on Facebook because that's a, that's a sort of different relationship and it's not nearly as boundaried and it won't be as safe. Good point, Jane. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to pass the microphone back to Barbara, who's going to talk a little bit about a project we've been doing at Clark. So uh, in the beginning, uh, Jan mentioned that we're uh, both involved in a project we call the Tea Visit Project, uh, and that's a project where we're using uh, virtual intervent, virtual uh, platforms like sort of like Skype uh, to reach families and expand um, the access that families have to early intervention services using video conferencing technology. Uh, Sorry. The, so we, we actually refer to these uh, as virtual home visits. Um, and this is just one example. We actually had a webinar all about, um, about telepractice. And uh, if you go to the Clark website and look on, online, you'll see it, that archived if you want more information. But one of the things that I did want to mention is that we have learned from, from um, doing these teleservices uh, for a, a little more than two years, that although face-to-face -face interaction is terrific, that sometimes being um, separated by a, 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 t a TV or, or a computer screen actually can improve practice. And that was a surprise mm. to us, I think, in some ways. Um, but it really does make some sense. If you're not there in person, you can't reach in and, and um, fix it with mm. the child. You can't put the hearing aid in that fell out. You can't um, pick up on, on the story time that, that, um, that the mother is having difficulty with. What you can do and what you have to do is coach the parent mm. uh, where they're the primary interactor. And so we're finding that when early intervention practitioners uh, use this kind of technology, it actually teaches, it teaches us uh, how to be better coaches and um, also gives us opportunities to observe a little bit more than sometimes feels comfortable when we're face to face. We've discovered that when you develop a relationship, a relationship can be developed online and over, over the video conferencing airways, and that it is possible um, if, we, if we use all of these strategies, um, especially supporting parents, understanding, understanding that emotion and motion mm -hmm. <laughs> um, interact in, in mm -hmm. interesting ways. Um, if, we, if we apply all of those techniques, the medium is really less important than, um, than we had, had initially feared mm -hmm. or, or, or wondered about. And so um, today we'd, we'd like to leave you uh, with uh, another wonderful um, wonderful quote from David Luderman, another set of his wonderful words of wisdom. Uh, David said that there are no intervention techniques more powerful than those that serve to build parental self-esteem. Mm -hmm. uh, it's another one if you want to print out and put up mm -hmm. on your wall. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it really is helpful because when we get stuck and when we worry that we're not doing enough or we're not doing the right thing or how do we correct that speech sound, um, we can get very lost in the details and we can forget that um, that huge chunk of time that parents have with their child when you're not around is really the most important time. And if, if they, if they um, feel good about themselves, if they feel that they actually have the skills and the knowledge um, to, be a, to be a parent to a child that was not the child they expected, then the outcomes will be will be so much better. Thank you, Barbara. So if you have questions, I hope you wrote them down during the presentation, and you can send them uh, to this address, and we will respond to them directly. Thank you for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to do this, and we're glad when people come back, and we look forward to talking to you some more in the future. Have a good day. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye.